to my channel. Sorry I've been gone for a while. Things have been crazy. Um, but I figured I'd come and talk to you guys about well, what I've been doing actually for the past about month um, and how things have completely changed for me recently. So I last Wednesday graduated from flight attendant training and um, spent three and a half weeks in Wyoming and and did my initial training, passed all of my exams and my practicals and everything, which is super exciting. So I'm so excited to finally start my uh, dream career that I've wanted to do for so, so long. But there's a lot of things out there that I've been finding. There's a lot of prospective Facebook pages for different airlines for flight attendants. There's some YouTube videos out there about what to expect from interviews, which I've done one for the airline I'm currently with, um, which you can find in um, below. But I figured also there's not a whole lot of information on flight attendant training itself. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. One, we're super busy, we're super stressed, and we're super tired. So you don't really have time to just put together a video and kind of talk about what it is that is going on. Second is there's a lot of security issues. So um, in turn, pre-warning, I'm gonna try and answer as many questions and talk about as many things as I can um, without giving too much away in terms of the security aspect. So, um, but anyway, so my airline, like I said, training is three and a half weeks. It is in Wyoming. And um, the way that works is training will start on a Monday, I believe it is, always on a Monday. So you will fly out Sunday afternoon. You will fly into Denver. The airline will book your uh, transportation on the airline to Denver. And then they use a third party company that will then um, <clears throat> take you the hour and about 45 minutes from Denver to Wyoming. You do have to make a transfer in Fort Collins. Now, the transfer seems stressful. It's super easy. They literally have just, it's one, the big bus from the airport comes and then they disperse everyone into smaller shuttle vans because they're going to smaller disturbed places rather than like a big charter bus, which is what you initially get picked up at on. Um, you continue up and you go. Now, my recommendation for you is when you are giving your accommodation request forms for the airline to fly out to Denver, look at, go to the website, um, take a look at the flights that are available. Now, sometimes you're not going to have a direct route either, but you put in what flights you want as your request. My recommendation is take the earliest flight out of the day for you from where you live. And the only reason that I say that, or at least in the mid-morning, the only reason I say that is because <clears throat> when you land in Denver, the shuttles are based on like about three hour block increments. So if you land at 10, like I, so there was a shuttle that left at 10 o'clock. I landed at 10.15. I had to wait until the 12.30 shuttle. Then on top of that, it's another two more hours. So already that was a four hour block of time that I was wasting trying to get there. So my recommendation is, like I said, if you take an early flight, you get there in the morning. If you miss the earlier shuttle, you have to wait for an hour or two or three. You then take the two hour shuttle that gets you in by mid early afternoon, which is great because you can check into the hotel. Um, you can get yourself unpacked. You can meet your roommate. You can get your mindset ready to go. There are people who arrived into training, into the hotel at 1 a.m. from the shuttle. We had to be at training at 8 a.m. and we had a test at 8 a.m. on Monday. So my recommendation is don't arrive late because you're going to be having to stress about unpacking. You might be disturbing your roommate who's trying to sleep and be prepared for the test. Or you just go right to bed and you're like all flustered the next morning. So my recommendation is fly in early, get to the hotel, and um, you can unpack. You also then, for me, what I did with some of my friends was we went, um, we took an Uber. We Ubered to Walmart and Target and we bought like energy drinks, snack food for class, um, even just like cup of noodles and things like uh, I got pretzels and hummus and I got like cheese and meat. Um, there's a mini fridge and a, and a microwave in there. So I also got hangers because there's only about five hangers in the hotel rooms. So <clears throat> you can buy the plastic ones that are like two ninety nine. So even if your roommate wants to split it with you, you can get like 20 hangers. Um, <clears throat> it really works really well. So that is my recommendation in terms of travel to the facility. Now, of course, each person is going to do their own thing. But for me, that's what I wanted to do. It set me up for success from day one of training because I was able to not stress. I was at... Um, the hotel by about 2.30 and my other friends arrived at about, some of my other friends arrived about 8 or 9 o'clock at night, but we were able to do dinner. We had unpacked and oriented with myself with the training facility, um, where everything was in the hotel and things like that. Um, so in terms of the hotel itself, the hotel is, um, 
we stay in a hotel and the training, our classroom is also in the hotel in one of the ballrooms. The hotel is very nice. It's very, very secluded. So you are very distant from things. Um, a four person Uber on average is about 20 bucks. A uh, six person, which is the max is like 30. So um, they do have a shuttle called the Cowboy Shuttle. It's like a taxi. It's $10 cash each way for as many people as you can take. It's a minivan. Um, my recommendation is if you are in a time crunch, do not rely on that because they will tell you 20 minutes, an hour, hour and a half later, they finally show up. So if you are like, I need to go do this now, you just need to pay for the Uber, unfortunately. So the hotel, like I said, you will have a roommate. You don't get to choose who your roommate is. You are given a roommate. It's not so bad for the winter, uh, for the summer months, but in the winter, um, the hotel is a um, compound and uh, the hotel lobby, the restaurant where we have breakfast and lunch and if you want dinner, as well as the training facility is all in the center. And then all of the hotel rooms are in four lodges that are segregated. Now they're not very far, um, but for us it was like four degrees in the morning and snowing and really windy. Of course, it was very freezing for that couple hundred feet to cross the icy road and sidewalk to get in. So it's something to think about. Um, the hotel, like I said, is a live hotel too. So really just be super professional and when you're around other hotel guests. You do have a lounge in there at night. They do ask that we buy things. Um, they're totally fine with us studying. They're very supportive. They're very, very friendly, but they don't want us just in there studying and taking up the lounge and not actually purchasing something. You do have a gift shop, which has some snacks and stuff like that. And then there is a gas station um, at the end of the driveway, um, not that far down. It's like a two minute walk um, down there too. So that's kind of the hotel. One thing I will say too is um, your entire training is still an interview. You're not guaranteed the job. And you're being interviewed based on your performance, on your tests, your behavior with your fellow classmates, as well as your behavior with hotel guests and hotel staff. Hotel staff and the airline are very close. The head instructors and the managers of the hotel talk all the time. If you misbehave in the restaurant, the airline will know about it within an hour. They just will know. And they will pull you aside and they will talk with you about it. Um, if your behavior is really bad, they will just send you home. You aren't allowed in anybody else's rooms, so that's something to think about. They did give us a study hall space as well that was available, um, and the hotel staff is super nice about, you know, making sure we were well taken care of. And like I said, they're so supportive. They've had classes there already, and so they'll know, oh, you guys have a test today, and they're like, good luck on your test, and things like that. Um, so just be super nice back to them as well. The buffet, I will tell you with the buffet, it is very carb heavy and it is very meat heavy. If you are vegetarian, vegan, you are health conscious, the buffet, the buffet will not have pretty much anything for you but salad. It is all pastas, mashed potatoes, meats, um, desserts, cheeses, it, soups that are all meaty. Like it's very meat and carb heavy. It's a very good buffet. Each day is a specific um menu and it wrote it'll be the same so for three weeks three and a half weeks you're gonna have this on mondays you're gonna have the same menu on tuesdays it'll be the same and there's a lot of similarities between the entire week too um dinners and sundays you are on your own though so and then in the mornings you get a light breakfast from the hotel sorry i have some notes written down here because i wanted to make sure i have everything hangers you're walking outside packages you can receive packages there um just put that you're with the airline and your room number uh, it is a $5 charge per package, both inbound and outbound. So just think of that. Um, you can use a credit card, which is great. So um, clothes, you will get your study packet and it will tell you, but uh, you are only allowed to wear black and white. That is it. For class, there are a couple days, um, Fridays and Saturdays, we are allowed to wear casual wear. So it is jeans with no holes. Um, and then it is a <clears throat> shirt. You cannot, I cannot wear a shirt like this. It has to be a, uh, collared shirt as well. You don't have to wear dress shoes, but you do have to wear a collared shirt. Um, I would bring a shirt though one day that's more like a, lo a long sleeved t-shirt like this. Um, you will want to have that for the end of the month of training, um, for one of the specific days. You don't have to. It just, for me, as I'm more comfortable in wearing my dress shirts, um, doing the practicals that we were doing there. Um, hair, I don't know if you can tell I have, usually I have my hair fully dyed at the top. Um, I had a lot of it grow out and so my roots were showing. They were telling me that that's not allowed. Now I know females were having highlights in their hair. It does have to be natural color. Um, they told me that this was not allowed. So I'm growing my hair out again and I actually have a spray that I just color it in for each day when I'm gonna be working um, until my 
hair fully grows out because it's just a little bit left now. But if you do have a lot of highlights and things like that, especially for guys, they will tell you that's not allowed. So my recommendation is get your hair dyed to your natural color um, before you come or make it all one color. Don't do like my natural black here and then do like a light blonde at the top. They won't like that. They want it to be one natural color. So something to think about, um, don't spend the money to change it to something because they will tell you, you know what, you need to change it back. Um, like I said, your behavior is constantly being monitored. Um, I, unfortunately, there were some behaviors in our class that were not the greatest for multiple reasons that um, I don't know fully. Um, and the airline will never shame somebody when they le make them leave or that if you fail a test, it is very done discreetly. Um, all of a sudden, you'll be looking around and you say, oh, that person is now gone. And they're gone. Um, so just keep in mind, be supportive of your other classmates. Do not talk rude to the hotel staff. Be very, very nice to your fellow classmates. Um, you know, the thing is, what the, the reason that they're so stingy on this is they say they want to know, how is it that you're going to be on an aircraft with people you don't know, one that you're working with, and people that might annoy you or push buttons for you that you're working with on a five-hour flight, and two, how are you going to treat customers that are pissing you off because they said something rude to you or they gave you a nasty look? How are you going to treat those customers? And in turn, with all of our hotel contracts, how are you going to behave in the hotel overnight? Are you going to be courteous to the staff? Are you going to be super wild and crazy at night when you're on layovers? Those all things can affect the airline overall. And so this is a way that they're, you're proving to them, I am a professional. You know, a lot of people think when you... When we deep, when we land, we deep plane passengers. We're done for the day. We're going to our hotel. We're done for the day. We are checked out. We are no longer working. That is not true. You know, we have big contracts with the airline, with the hotels, and like I said, hotels still for working crew members are telling the airline, you know what, this crew, this specific person was causing us issues or whatever. So it's a way that we are still always working. We're always representing the airline. You know, especially if, if it's a big city that we service. You might have five, six, seven, eight crews of four or five people in there. So you might have 40, 50 people of our airline sitting in that hotel room. So you also don't know who else is going to be there. You also have upper management and things like that that are randomly traveling that also could be staying in those hotels. So just something to think about. The days are long. Um, you are in class from 8 to 6.30-ish every day, Monday through Saturday. Sundays are our off days. Um, the reason I say off days is because on Mondays you have tests. So you're not really off because you've been you you need to study for your test that's at 8 a.m. All tests are going to be at 8 a.m. the first thing you get in the morning. Um, you do get breaks about once an hour. Lunch is about an hour. But in the beginning it is a lot of just lecture after lecture after lecture after lecture. Make sure you do not look like you're sleeping. You are uninterested. If you look like that, they will send you home. If you feel tired, stand up. They encourage you. Stand up on the side of the room. And we want you to stay awake. We know that this is a lot of material that we're sending at you. Things like that. They tell you. They're very, very supportive. And the thing, I will say this. The one thing that freaked me out with flight attendant training was what are the tests going to be like? Because I am not a good test taker. I can do a verbal test very well. A written exam is very, very hard for me. And the thing that they will tell you, and I 100% do not understand, and they will tell you this too, no one understands what we mean when we say trust the process. By the time you finish it, it all makes sense. And it's true, trust the process. They're giving you information a little bit at a time to build building blocks, and all of a sudden, it's all going to make sense. But even on the lectures, they're going to say, you know what, this is all the information is important. Don't get me wrong. It's very important. You're going to use all the information that they're throwing at you every single day. But sometimes they'd be like, you know what, this might appear upon a test that's coming up soon. You might really want to know this next slide. And they'll even give you time. And there's some instructors that will say, you know, blah, 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 blah. I can't say what it is, but, you know, say something. Then they'll say it again. Then they'll say it a third time. If they're doing that, they might not be verbally telling you, this is a question on your test tomorrow. But it's, take your pen out and start writing those notes. I need to know this information. They're so supportive, though, of you. They will do a test review with you. You get a learning tablet with the quizzes on it. The quizzes are paraphrases and 98% similar to the actual test itself. So it's so supportive of a way, that, of a great learning environment to for you to be successful. If you don't use the tools that they're giving you, such as 
taking really good detailed notes, listening in class, not being distracted, doing the quizzes, you are setting yourself up for failure. And you get one retake, all your tests have to pass at 90. I'm so fortunate, I did not have to use my retake. And that's the mindset you should have. You shouldn't say, I have a retake in the back of my head and let that be my lifesaver, no. And you can take those retakes as many times as you want. They have demonstration videos on there, all of the slide presentations are also all loaded onto the devices. So you can literally go back into it. You have your device during, during classroom. You can highlight things. You can scribble on the devices as well or take your handwritten notes. I mainly just took handwritten notes, but people were going back and forth. Um, but like I said, they are so supportive of you succeeding and they don't want anybody to fail. So as long as you trust them and the way that they're giving you the materials and they're giving you the resources to do it, and you take advantage of that, you'll be so successful. The people that I saw that didn't want to take advantage of it sometimes, you'll see, aren't going to be as successful. So even if you're like, you know what, I know this, still take the quizzes. Still, you know, go over the, the lectures again because it will help you because then when you get to take the test, you won't be thinking. It's going to be second nature to you and it's all just going to be, oh, I know this answer, I know this answer, I know this answer. I and you're gonna be a straight A student. So that is my biggest information like tip we can get you about testing. Do not let testing freak you out. Um, you know, I have test anxiety, I know some of my other people that I know have test anxiety, and you know, don't doubt yourself in the process that you're not gonna do good. Because if you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. And the instructors are super good. If you do fail your test, you have a retake and you after each test, they'll say, does anyone have any questions? Or if a lot of us got questions wrong, they will say, you know what? These are the general questions that everyone was getting wrong. We're going to go over the answers and we're going to make sure you guys all understand it because then later on down the road, if you see the question again, it's going to be there. And I will tell you, they're not going to throw a curveball question in there. You're not going to be talking about lecture A and they're going to tell you you're going to be tested on lecture A and all of a sudden you started doing tech lecture B a little bit and all of a sudden you're seeing lecture B questions, but they told you not to worry about it. You're never gonna see that. They are going to be so transparent with you as much as possible. They're not throwing random questions at you, curveballs, and trying to make you fail. They wanna make you think, but they want you to be successful. So that is my um, tidbit on that as well with testing. Um, <clears throat> flying home was a little bit interesting for me. Um, the reason being is there's one person that will create what is called your IOE, your initial operating experience. And that is your final certification flight that you have to do once you graduate in order to become a full-fledged flight attendant. Um, my class was about half the, almost, uh, right above half the size that, that normal classes have been. Um, and so they told us that all of our IOEs were within about a week, about eight days, nine days of us graduating. And... Um, but the thing is this, is that you don't know what your IOE is. They don't come to talk to you about your IOE flight until Tuesday. You graduate on Wednesday. So one thing that was beneficial for me is, and I didn't worry about this until like weeks, right after I'd taken my final on Monday, I started worrying about it, is I looked at my flights home on the app and I said, okay, what flights can I take home? What makes the most sense? Because they do... There's two options. They either want to get you home right away or you're going to go on your IOE right away. Now, if you go on your IOE right away, those are mainly for people that are going to be Denver-based and live in Denver, or they can get you home Wednesday after, like Wednesday night, um, and you live in one of the close bases, which pretty much I would say would be only Las Vegas. Um, the only people that had IOEs on Thursday were the people that were based in Las Vegas and lived in Las Vegas. Everybody else had at least one day um, to do it. But... For me, for instance, my airline did not have any flights home on Wednesday night like they normally do or the two a day on Thursday like they normally do. So all of my friends um, left Wednesday. I spent all of Thursday at the hotel by myself. Friday morning by myself, late Friday morning, I finally left and I came home. Now my IOE is this coming Friday. Um, so I had a very long time. Now I was thinking, why pay to stay me in a hotel? Why not just send me on my IOE, right? That makes most sense. I'll go out Thursday, like they'll fly me out Wednesday night and they'll just send me right to my IOE. Well, no. Uh, and I think it's also due because they do want you to go home. They do want to get you home first uh, so you can take stuff home and then you go on your IOE. So like I said, you do have some time. If you are if you are a commuter, they, will pay, they are required to get you to your base. So they will fly you from where you live 
to your IOE, from your IOE end location to your base. If you put down your mover, you will get moving days and you'll figure that out. Um, you, we bid for those at the beginning of week two. We found out them at the end of week two. The beginning of week three, we got a paper that showed how many moving days you get. And after those moving days, that's when your IOE is. But you are responsible then. They will fly you home from training, but you are responsible then to get yourself from training back to your base. And that's where your base and IOE experience is going to start from. So um, something to think about with your IOEs is just plan. You might not get, you know, even if, even for instance, like me, I live in Seattle. My base is in Las Vegas. They could have, if there was a flight Wednesday night, let's say, which there usually is. They could have flown me out Wednesday night. I would have gone back Wednesday night. I could have had Thursday off. Friday morning, they could have flown me to Las Vegas. And Saturday, I could have had my IOE. And that happened for a lot of people. So don't try to plan, like, let's go to the wedding. Let's go to this birthday party. Let's do this whole celebration. Because you don't know until Tuesday afternoon what's going on. Graduation is on Wednesday in the middle afternoon. I think it's like 3 o'clock. There were people on a 445 shuttle. You literally leave right away. And you will find that information out on Tuesday when you're leaving and things like that. But just plan. You might be one of the last people to go home. You might be one of the first people to go home and you have zero time at home. You have zero control over that. That is what the airline industry is about. You have to be flexible. So something to think about there um, with that. You are able to have your people come to your graduation. Um, they are responsible for their own transportation, their own hotel, everything like that. So they are invited. Um, but something to think about. <coughs> I had one other thing I was going to talk about, and I don't remember now. Studying. Studying was one. Um, so like I said, classes from 8 a.m. to 6, 6, 6.30. Sometimes we do let out 5.30 actually a lot. So between 5.30 and 6.30, you're going to be let out. I would go to the gym, um, and then I would go to study. And we would order DoorDash and, or bring our own food. That we'd sit in the study room and study or sit in the lounge and buy a drink or buy some food from there and study. Um, studying until about like mm, 10, curfews at 11, or at least for my class was at 11. Um, be back in my rooms by 11. I would usually not study anymore by that point. I would try to just take a chill, um, decompose, and then I was up at 5.30 every day. The biggest thing too is create a schedule from the beginning with your roommate and say, you know what, I'll get up a little bit earlier and get ready because I want to go in the mornings. I got up earlier than my roommate. Um, I would be at breakfast by about 6, 6.10. I would eat, and then my friend and I would study again and review material or just take some time to just, you know, relax before going to class or tests or whatever. So um, something to think about there is create, know what your study habits are, but also know you do have to share a bathroom. You do have other things you're sharing in that hotel room that you have one other person. So think of their habits and likes and dislikes and um, things like that. So... I hope this video helps a little bit answer questions. I'm sorry if it doesn't. Um, I had so many questions going to training of what it was that was going to happen and how things were going to be and how the days were going to go and things like that. It is it is an amazing experience. You're going to make some of your closest friends in it. Um, you are going to probably make some enemies, unfortunately, because we all have unique, amazing personalities that sometimes other people don't appreciate and love so much. But just know that you are going to be working with them. They're your coworkers, and everyone deserves respect in training, out of training, on the line um, as well. It is a lot of lecture, a lot of note taking uh, as well. So make sure you are really dedicated. I use a lot of multiple colored pens, highlighters. Um, I didn't use the binder. They told us to bring a binder. I didn't use that. I didn't really use flashcards. I didn't use sticky notes and put them in my bathroom while the study. Um, for me, it was a lot of repetition of just maybe rewriting it down and color coding and understanding things um, there. And I just had what else I was going to tell you, and it just slipped out of my mind. So I'll probably remember in a second. But um, just trust the process. Really, really trust the process. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Um, you'll be so, so happy when you reach graduation day and you get to where you you get your wings, you get your badge. Um, you get your first flight of where I'm going to go and you're flying home. And you're like, oh, I know what this P means. Oh, I know that they're going to make this announcement now. And oh, I know that this is going to happen this. And even on your flight to training and home, tell the flight attendants, hey, I'm going to training. And a lot of times they know. They know because 
they just know how quickly the airline is growing and how often classes go. And usually you have somebody who's just glowing and either like is wearing their badge on the way home or is in black and white because you have to just professional going to the training facility. They just know that we're airline people. So um, there was that. But I do remember what it was. Bases. Uh, sorry, my foot is falling asleep. So bases. Um, there, currently, my airline has five bases. They are planning to open up a sixth base in 2020. Um, they haven't told us where it is yet. And uh, there might be more opening, but that's the only thing I've heard of. Your seniority in your class is based on the last four digits of your social security number. Now, my class had a total of 51 people. My social is in the low 7,000s. My seniority in the class was 14 out of 51. Um... Most classes usually have about 90 to 100 people in the class. So, something to think about. You will put down on your, uh, you will get on the big, end of week one, end of week one, I think on a Saturday, you will get your bid preference sheet. Put down the bases that you want in order. There is no rhyme or reason. There is no mathematical, like, let me put the second choice as my favorite because no. Put your first choice of what you want as number one. Number two is number two, three is three, four is four, five is five. The airline goes in and once all the current employees, if we have any transfer requests that we want to transfer bases or whatever, they do that. Then what they do is they say, okay, great. We have 20 spots available here for this airport. So let's see. Let's go down the list. Seniority number one. Okay, she has number one in her class. She bid for that, but it's not her number one here, so that's available. And they just go, oh, that person is? Okay, we'll bring them there. Until they felt that slot. Then they go to the next airport. Okay, he was number two, and it's worked their way down. So there's no rhyme or reason. I will tell you, um, do not... Airline operational needs change daily. So when you are in training, and like they did for us, they said, we're sending most of the people to this specific base. Yeah. And then they said, most people don't go to these two bases because they're super senior. Well, it was the exact opposite. Everyone went to those other two senior bases, and hardly anybody went to the base that they thought everyone was going to go to. It is all based on operational need, so don't be discouraged. You can put in a transfer request for your airline. Um, with the airline, once you graduate training, you cannot switch your base in training. Um, unfortunately, some people did get their fourth or even fifth choice um, for their base. So the nice thing though is our airline is training classes once a month, and all those people bump your seniority, and everything in the airline world is about seniority. So. It's really, really good that you know once you if you don't like your base, you can bid you can bid the next month um, for your base transfer. If it's awarded to you, you will get that preference over the newbies that are in op, uh, initial experience training. So just so you know, they're not going to get a preference over you. They're going to pull all the current employees first of what our requests are to transfer bases or whatever, and then they will put all the new hires in to fill everything else, which is great because also your seniority then also in that group continues to go up within um, that base. So. Um, they are really expanding a lot of bases right now, too, also opening a new base, so there's going to be a lot of potential for growth, um, getting the line, hopefully flying a lot, and I'll let you guys know, the goal of my channel really now is, now that I've finished training, is to really do a lot of vlogs about talking about the day in life as a flight attendant, and I know that there's so many out there, and each airline is different of how things are worked, um, talking about my life as reserve and what that looks like, and kind of just more going over how... It is starting off from someone who's never been in the airline world and then going in and understanding, okay, this is how I bid every month. This is how I can aggressive bid. This is how I can commute home. This is the websites that we use. These are the logins that we use. This is like, it, you know, it all is things of a flight attendant world that's so unknown and they kind of just throw you in there. You get, we get about two hours where they explain the websites, but we don't actually go into them in depth. They don't talk about like, if you're commuting, this is how you do it. This is how you list yourself. This is how, they just don't. They say, if you have questions, email here. And that is it. So thankfully I have friends who use the software that we use. So I've been like asking them up a storm. I've been contacting the union reps that help us with these things and asking them questions of how do I do this? How do I do this? So that I understand because the thing for me is that bidding scheduling for us starts the 6th of the month through the 12th um, or the 16th and 18th for reserves. And um, of course, I'm just starting and that's when that bid period is about to start. So I need to be ready to understand what it is I'm bidding for and how I'm doing it so that I can, I know that I'm specific with what I'm bidding for, but if there's any preferences or I know how to aggressive bid for trips, if I'm on reserve to try to guarantee myself flying um, and things like that. But really when you're thinking about bases, think about, you know, 
for me, I plan to work a lot. I don't have a big Thai connection back here in Seattle to family, a significant other, things like that. So for me, it's about flying, it's about making money. Some people want this for the benefits, and so they're wanting to work the minimum hours. Perfectly fine. And so you need to decide with your base choice, what is going to be the most convenient for you to either commute, if you are commuting, you know, and you have a significant other or loved ones or kids, you know, if you're working a five-day stint and you get two days off in a row, but you might be flying in the end of your fifth day, so you can't fly out that night usually, but you want to make sure because you're flying standby, you're flying out the first of that morning. So say you're flying out, you're, my reserve ends sat Friday, I get in from a trip Friday night. Saturday morning, I list myself, I get on a plane back to Seattle. I'm in Seattle by like 9, 10 a.m. if I get the 6 a.m. flight out of Vegas. But then the next morning on Sunday, because Sunday to Vegas is such a busy route for me, I can't try to catch the 7 p.m. flight, the last flight of the day out of Seattle and guarantee myself that because I reserve on Monday. I have to try and start trying to get home by like noon on Sunday. So you're only home for like 12 hours or 14 hours, let's say. And then you're coming right back to work. So it's really something to think about is, you know, how is it that I'm going to be able to commute home? You can also try and trade shifts. So you can also, we have to work a specific amount of hours a month of guaranteed 11 days off a month. So you can always try and manipulate your schedule and picking up and dropping reserve days to where you could try to do it where you have a full week off. So it's seven days in a row and then work a ton at the end of the month and just not be home. So something to think about with your base is how easy also is it for me to commute from where I live to my base. We can jump, we can, it's called jump seat on other airlines as well as a commuter, but that's something to think about. For me, thankfully there's 16 flights a day between Seattle and Las Vegas. And I can also route through Portland, I can go through Spokane, I, I like I have multiple routings that I can get to Vegas if I need to. But if you're flying from where I used to live in Eastern Washington, they only fly nonstop to Vegas like three days a week on a, one of my other airlines. And so for me, I'd have to list to get from my small town to Seattle and then list again from Seattle there. And both flights are usually really full segments. So it makes it really hard. Um, also, if they're only flying one or two flights a day and, and my airline's the only one that does it, you're also a little bit harder because what if the flight's full? Now granted, we can sit on the jump seat, but if someone of a higher seniority has the same idea as you, you're gonna get bumped. And now all of a sudden you don't have a seat to get on the plane and that was the second flight of the day. You're now not able to make it to work. So I think that's really big things to think about. Um, also with that, a lot of people do commute in the day before, and then we of course stay in the crash pad. Um, the crash pad Facebook group is really helpful. That's where I found mine. There's crash pad 411. Your crew bases do have crash pad information if you do need that. Um, but like I said, try to get it before you hand you go. Try to be as prepared as possible because it's such a different lifestyle. This is not just a job, it is a lifestyle of how you're gonna live, eat healthy, you're gonna be working out, you're gonna be traveling, you're gonna be in air all the time. So um, things to think about. Um, one final note, I promise. I'm so sorry this is long-winded. I'm just trying to think of everything. Um, Wyoming is at 6,000 feet, so um, I'm at sea level in Seattle, and so I think we didn't have this, but a lot of people, um, you suffer from altitude sickness because there's lack of oxygen. They have It's very dry, so a lot of people get nosebleeds. People got sick really easily because the weather in the winter, it would be four degrees, snowing heavily, Horrible side went 60 degrees in the afternoon and negative five at night. In one day, it would do this whole loop-de-loop -loop and you would see all the weather. So you're already stressed, you're doing long days, things like that, and people got sick and it got sick really fast. It spread through 95% of their class in under two, and like I think it was three days, 90% of the class was sick. And it lasted for like a week and a half, almost two weeks. So really boost your immune system when you get there, take care of yourself. Um, drink lots and lots and lots of water. They have water fountains and, and pitchers and stuff in there for us. So drink lots of water. Stay hydrated. Um, make sure you can get rest and you can take your naps. I took a nap during lunch usually. Make sure you set all your alarms. On, early is on time. On time is late. Be there five, ten minutes early than what you should be so that you are ready to go. Because if you arrive in, if they tell you to be there at 8 and you show up at 7.59 and you sign in and that clock says 8 as you haven't signed in, you are now tardy. So don't do that. Be on time. Be on time by being early. So anyways, I really hope this helped answer your questions. Like I said, for security reasons, there's a lot of things that I would love to talk about. I just can't. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to comment below. Um, or you can message me on social media. I'd be happy to try to answer more detailed questions that way um, that I'm able to. But I wish 
everybody who's going through the flight attendant process, especially with my airline, the most best of luck. The team at high and recruiting, as well as the in-flight training department is absolutely amazing. You will have an awesome experience. Just trust in what they're doing and that they're taking care of you and that you'll be rewarded immensely with your wings when you graduate if you just do what they say. And I really look forward to being able to fly with some of you guys out on the line in just a couple months. But like I said, I'm James. Thanks so much for taking a look at this video. Give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I will talk with you guys soon. Bye!